the imagination. And um, the, 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 the second model, which is the model I'm settled in, is the institute. And that was a post-French Revolution model, where the idea was of a specialist education. So many things stand outside the institute or the center model. It is exclusionary, it is exclusive, unlike the standard university. Then you have this internet or virtual uh, model, which it, where the stress is on information and fast speed transmission of information and it is not really about knowledge it, because the speed of transmission doesn't get t give time for information to be transformed into knowledge. I want to talk only about the two Indian types of universities which is uh, India, uh, you know, has had a long tradition of universities for about um, 2,000 years, you have Nalanda, you have Dakshila, beautiful sites of universities. But I want to talk about Shanti Niketan because it was set up as a modern university by Rabindranath Tagore and, it, and he essentially was, saw a university as an open space without boundaries and an international space. Uh, uh, so it was very important for Tagore that anybody could walk into the university. The degrees, you may or may not get a degree, but you could walk into its space and take part in the debates. Now, of course, this sounds like too ideal a model, and out of two with our times. But I would like to put it before you, because it is an extant university. It works, it's there and you can, you can go to it, so it's not a virtual thing at all. And uh, there are many things that I could say about this, but uh, part of it is whether we, need, whether we have to dismiss this idea of the university. Then we have another kind of university which I'm quite interested in, which is the peripatetic model. Scholars go in and out, and post-colonial scholars are like this, they travel in and out, and not much of post-colonial theory is actually generated far away from the post-colonies. And uh, uh, th this is an old tradition because Parivrajakas were part of an Indian tradition of traveling scholars. And traveling scholarship, scholarship is something that perhaps we can draw upon, but it raises all the questions about roots that we have, about, you know, what about emotional belonging? What about authenticity anxieties? What about that still center that all writers need? Um, Oh, uh, will not all this David Lodge's uh, toing and froing, the showing of the global strut, the self-marketing <laughs> implied by this peripatetic model, will it not strike at the very heart of creative writing? So I feel that in India we often ask the question, well, what is at the heart of writing and creative writing? So this brings me to my provocation three. And I'd uh, uh, like to say is that I, I want to argue as a cognitive scientist that I think that poetry, these redundant forms like poetry, song, narrative have survived in human cultures because they play a part in stimulating emotion because our palms sweat, our pulse rates go up, we kind of um, uh, react to a novel as if it's really happening if it's a good novel, that is. And yet, <laughs> of course, you know, um, the, 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 uh, it's, it's fiction. We know it's fiction. It's useless. It's a parable of words. And I think that what it does is to teach us cultural survival and emotional survival very cheaply. <laughs> very cheap <laughs> simulation <laughs> machines. And so these yeah. simulation machines that we have are at the center of the greatest conundrum in cognitive science today, which is how do we generate emotions? Emotions are the drivers of who we are because it's perfectly rational to lie down and die if you know you're going to die anyway. <laughs> Why expend any time and energy living? <laughs> What stories do is to give you that that story, 
which you follow through. So I think it is very important and it does connect to the production of knowledge and the intellectual question, which is why I think we need writers in the heart of our university, uh, universities. And I believe the 20th century is, is producing what I call the postmodern emotions and Sienna Gai calls ugly emotions. That is irritation, anger, you know, irritation, anxiety, boredom. Uh, not quite the great emotions of rage, pity, the Aristotelian things, but these very, very powerful things which we can't control. And those are the measure of our crisis. So I think modern writers describe a whole new emotional terrain which is very interesting for knowledge in the universities. I, I don't know whether we have time, but I have two tests here, and if I could please try one of these tests. <laughs> so, so they're at the bottom of page five, um, and you know, I've asked students, this is a very, very knowledgeable audience, so you will know words like ocellus and pedosis, no doubt, but lots of my students don't. <laughs> so I just asked them to pick the words, which, which one they would pick for a poem, and which one would you pick? One, right? Yeah. Everybody agrees. Now you don't know the meanings. So you're guessing on something which is not meaning, but sound, structure, and so on. And a whole history of cultural analysis. So we, I do lots of tests like this, which I think are actually relevant to writing and why one chooses. But, and the next test is, here we have enormous disagreement. Which two are written by a computer and which two by human beings? It doesn't matter. There's never any agreement on this question. I can tell you the answer. The main thing is, that computers can be taught to write poetry, short ones, which are, you know, people can't tell, sensitive literary audiences. So, uh, to me, this proves that creative writing can indeed be taught. Point, which is that you know you then can begin to ask questions of the technological type. Uh, if Arika and Anna Karolina, one of my students gave me this, had had a cell phone with Tolstoy's novel, really have been 800 pages long, <laughs> and all these other sorts of questions. And the serious question here is: Will these new technologies really generate, like like print, the printing press created a private space? For reading, and I believe uh, will they generate new literary forms? Yeah. I was talking to Chris, and he said no. He thought this was a red herring. I think they will because of the dialogic basis and the poor, the the the, uh, the thing between orality and literacy, which is very important to us because the literary traditions are often oral traditions and exist as training of the imagination outside the university. So I think bringing orality together with literacy uh, is very important and new technologies force us to think about these things. My final point, in India, where I come from, it's a very young country, 75, 70 percent of the population is below the age of 35. It's also a very a confident country and in some ways we are all illiterate in India, every single one of us. And the reason for this is that we have so many written scripts and we cannot understand each other's written scripts. And the writing, and this goes to John's point, is written in different scripts. So it's not enough to know the language, you have to know the script. And you have this pervasive sense 